Tonight on The Buzz, we start with William LeChase. He's been creating unique photographic images since he was six. Now that he's an adult, he's developed unique and memorable advertising campaigns for some of the largest advertisers in the world. Tonight, he joins us to share his techniques on lighting for advertising. Next, recently SAG-AFTRA released a new rate card for independent films. Jonathan Handel, the entertainment labor editor for The Hollywood Reporter, joins us tonight to explain what these new rate cards mean. Finally, Susan LaChase is both a producer and an actor. In fact, she's the lead in a crime comedy series called Sketchy. She joins us tonight to describe how to survive as an actor in LA. All this plus Tech Talk, Buzz Flashback, and Randy Altman's perspective on the news. The buzz starts now. Tonight's digital production buzz is brought to you by Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com and by Advantage Video Systems at AdvantageVideoSystems.com. Since the dawn of digital filmmaking, authoritative. One show serves a worldwide network of media professionals. Current. Uniting industry experts. Production. Filmmakers. Post-production. And content creators around the planet. Distribution. From the media capital of the world in Los Angeles, California, the digital production buzz goes live now. And welcome to the Digital Production Buzz, the world's longest-running podcast for creative content producers covering media production, post-production, marketing, and distribution around the world. Michael, it's the middle of July. It is. And there's not a lot of new news happening this week. You know how I know it's the middle of July? I'm afraid to we even just ask. Started, we just started selling tickets to uh, to the Amsterdam Super Meet, mm -hmm. and I sent out the, the list to the past uh, attendees. Nobody's there. I got bounce backs from everybody. I am on vacation. I'm on the holiday. I'm gonna. I'll be back in August. Which means that's you, how I know it's the middle of July. You're already stressing about getting people to show up at an event that doesn't even occur. I know for it doesn't even occur months. to it. Yeah. Have you announced the agenda? Yes. No. <laughs> Are you kidding? No, um, we have no idea. Today, today, I, I just want you to know, because you are such the technical guru. Yeah, nobody works in Europe. They're nobody, all on vacation. Nobody works here either, but that's, <laughs> that's a true. separate speech. <laughs> today, Panasonic announced a 4K video camera. Yeah, I didn't read the specs. less so. than $700 US. So the question Wait a minute, less than you, seven, I thought it was like $1,200. Well, some ridiculously small amounts. So my question is, is it the end of civilization as we know it? I don't know. We have one of those photographers on our agenda today. We maybe ask him if he's looked into it, but seven, no, it's not $700. I will have my research team I look it up. I think it's $1,200. Just a minute. Is it? There's two. There's there two, were two cameras. One of them was like one of them 600. Was for seven, really? See? All right, Six, I'm 4K. buying it. That's it. <laughs> well, wait a minute. You can get those phones for, that do 4K, so, yeah. you know, come on. So, I can, well, what are you going to do with a 4K video camera? I, I don't know. You tell me, Larry. <laughs> we'll put it in the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> so, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to shoot video at 4K yeah. and edit it down to standard def. Right. And then post the standard def standard because that gives def. us plenty of resolution to work with. So Nobody's we can doing the standard def. We're at least doing high def. Do you know right? how many people are doing standard def? There's Who? side channels on satellites that are still doing 4x3 standard def. I get emails on it on a regular basis. Who? It's, where? In Bosnia and in Croatia? No, US. The US. Really? Trying to, yeah, there's a lot of... Very, very specialty channels. Well, we insulted a lot of Croatians right very there. Very weird. By the way... Sorry, guys. To, to see what we're up to, be sure to hang out with us on Facebook at digitalproductionbuzz.com and subscribe to our free weekly newsletter at digitalbuzz, digitalproductionbuzz.com. Here is Randy Altman. This is Randy Altman's Perspective. Randy Altman has been writing about our industry for more than 20 years. Now she runs her own blog at postperspective.com, taking a look at the post-production industry. Hello, Randy. Welcome back. Hi, Larry. How are you? We are doing great. What's the big news in our industry this week? There is no news. Everyone is on <laughs> vacation. You know, I just realized if it wasn't for product sales, there'd be nothing happening in our industry in July. But thinking about it, you're on the East Coast and we're on the West Coast. What are some of the trends that you're seeing develop this summer? Well, it's a trend that's sort of been developing for the last couple of years, um, but is sort of hitting its peak, which is the tax incentives offered by New York State and New York City. It's brought a ton of production onto Long Island, 
Westchester, Manhattan, and with that came a post-production tax incentive. So there has been a lot of work going on within the city, uh, not just production, but post as well. And what we're seeing is where New York facility, facilities used to go to the West Coast and pick up work, that's still happening a little bit, but there's more companies from L.A. moving out to New York and opening up studios to try to get a piece of production and post work. Interesting. Are we seeing new companies, or are we just seeing existing companies establish New York offices? The latter, for the most part. There are some new companies, but you've got a lot of people coming from L.A. There's a company in Philadelphia called Dive, which opened up in a New York studio specifically. Uh, they did some VFX work on The Leftovers for HBO not too long ago. So uh, people just want to be here. It's sort of amazing. It's fun to watch, actually, but... I feel bad for the actors because a lot of the shooting goes on in the winter, and they look pretty miserable in cold. And there's snow everywhere. <laughs> Uh, thinking on a, a different subject, there's been a lot of talk recently about cloud-based collaboration and video review. In fact, in May, we talked with John Chappelle about his software called Collaborate. Are you seeing much movement in the post houses toward uh, cloud-based post-production? Yes, more have been taking advantage of it. Um, specifically, you've got Digital Film Tree out in your area, which has embraced it. Uh, not only is that that's not only how they're color grading remotely, but they've also come up with a product of their own for cloud-based review and approval, but they're not alone. There's a bunch. There's Catabatic out here in New York that have also come up with their own. A lot of different post houses have developed their own app to solve some of the problems, and they're able to uh, tweak it to work exactly how they work, and now they're making it available out on the market as well. There's a handful, at least. I was taking a look at a couple of past issues that you were writing, and you're starting to see something different happening in color grading. What's going on there? Well, color grading has changed in that the tools allow the artist to do more than just color. So a lot of them are taking on tasks that are um, slightly VFX-oriented. So they're removing wires. They're fixing uh, healthy blemishes disappear. So it's not as though they're becoming VFX artists. There's still that that's being sent to the studios. but Little things here and there, they are able to, um, with the flexibility of the tools, take on themselves, and that helps a lot. Uh, recently, I interviewed the colorist for House of Cards, and um, I also just interviewed the colorist for Sharknado 3 out of Asylum, Asylum Entertainment. So two very different projects, Asylum and their Sharknado 3 has, those guys, I mean, there's 20, 25 films that they're, they're putting out a year, so their post-production workflow is in place, and they have very quick turnarounds. So they're just getting in and getting out. They're doing good work, but in this instance, their color grading uh, for the film is less about a look and more about maybe changing a sunny sky to a cloudy sky. All good stuff to talk about. Can we see you again next week? Now, I'm on vacation for the next two weeks. Yay. Um, but I'll be <laughs> back. If you keep asking me, I will. I'll come back. We always want you back. Randy Altman is the editor-in-chief of PostPerspective.com. Randy, thanks for joining us this week. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. To read more from Randy Altman, visit PostPerspective.com. When you're working with media, one thing is essential. Your computer needs peak performance. However, when it comes to upgrading your Mac, there are so many different options to choose from that the process can be confusing. That's why Otherworld Computing carries the best upgrades that lets your computer performance and storage grow as your needs grow. Since 1988, OWC has become one of the most trusted names in quality hardware and comprehensive support to the worldwide computer industry. With an extensive online catalog of Mac, iPhone, and iPad enhancement products, as well as a dedicated team of knowledgeable experts providing first-rate tech support, OWC has everything you need to take your current system to the next level. Whether you need to maximize your system's memory, add blazing speed, or enhance reliability, look no further than the friendly experts at OWC. Learn more by visiting MacSales.com today. That's MacSales.com.
William Lachasse has been creating unique photographic images since he was six years old. His work at ad agencies for clients such as Cadillac, Airwick, Sunbeam, Old Milwaukee Beer, Shakey's Pizza, and many others, has broken boundaries and created amazing ad campaigns. He is an expert at digital imagery. Bill, thanks for joining us. Thank you. What, what you took your first picture when you were six. Yeah. What is it that decided not just to mess around with cameras, but turn pro? What was that turning moment? I mean, between six and whenever? Well, <laughs> the 20 that you are now. Well, first of all, yeah. before you answer that, what camera was that when you uh, took the first picture at six? It was a two and a quarter Argo Flex that was a gift to my pre uh, parents when they got married. Argo Flex? It's kind of like an Let American Google version. that. <laughs> Go, yeah, what do the hell was an Argo Flex? Oh, yeah, it's twin lens uh, <clears throat> reflex. Can we uh, do oh, this in post production? The two lenses are above each other? Like a little, like a rolly. See, if, if Mike was. Oh, one of those. Oh, yeah. I had one of those. Yeah, here they are. Oh, it's like a Roloflex. Oh, you remember now? Okay. Yeah, it was, it was like a Roloflex. Yeah, absolutely. So you look down at it like this. Yeah, I looked down like that. And I, yeah. I um, they kept it in the uh, linen closet and I climbed up there and I took it out and I ran across the street to Dr. Wilkinson's yard and he had a big front yard with a big lawn and a lot of sprinklers that were always leaking. And I always noticed there were bees on those. So I, I looked through there and then I thought, wait a minute, I didn't know what parallax correction was, but I thought, well, I know I'm looking through this top lens, but I know the picture is being taken by the bottom lens. So I, I rearranged it. Cause now you're, it, you're seeing the picture backwards, right? When and you look backwards. Down, yeah. yeah. And but at such a close range, you know that the parallax is not going to correct on a camera like that. So I I knew to re-aim the camera, and I got the picture. It's somewhere. I think I still have it. The really? And somewhere. that was it. Yeah, well, I shot like two or three. But then, what turned you pro? Um, that B shot. My brother made that me. That B do shot it. would turn me pro. Yeah, <laughs> I got some cool ones the other day, actually. Of bees. But, my brother, yeah, bees. Cool. We have sunflowers in the front yard, so I, I saw some. Throw my phone, actually. <laughs> That's awful. So you got bee shots with your phone? Yeah, I did. Suzanne can find them right there. <clears throat> so six years old, I'm back just, to the I'm iPhone just, with bee I'm shots. I'm just sitting here. Don't you know, mind me. Just just keep talking about Come on, bees. That's awesome. <laughs> well, when I when I I'll, well, I I'll go to the when I really got interested was um, we went on a trip back east. Went to Washington D.C. and New York and Vermont to visit my aunt and everything. Just twist your mic closer to you. Oh, there you go. Nice yeah. mic. Yeah, it is. Mm. That's why we want to twist it closer to you. Okay. Well, anyway, we went on this trip, and my brother, my oldest brother, uh, took all the pictures because he was a control guy or something. He's now a police chief. Anyway, we got back, and nobody liked the pictures. You know, they were all <laughs> just not right, and... I'm I'm four years younger, and I'm looking at him going, yeah, those really suck, you know. So I, I know I can do better than that. I looked at everything over and over and over again. What could I do better? What could I do better? Figured it out, and then got into junior high school, took photo class in the summer, and and uh, went on to high school and did that. I won some competitions for commercial photography at uh, L.A. City College used to do a contest, and I won it two years in a row. Oh, you went to L.A. City College? No, I didn't know, but the the city college had the competitions for the high schools. Oh. And so I submitted uh, for two years in a row and, and won on the commercial thing. What year Met, was this? Because L.A. 60, city College did a lot of good stuff, especially in video and film. Yeah, this was 68, 69. Yeah, yeah they were way ahead of their time. Yeah. Was they, it? Yeah. Was it the lighting that appealed to you? Was it the composition? Was it being able to work with models and stage it? Was it the result of the photography? What is it that captures your attention? It was more like a communication thing came first. Like, why do you take a picture? Because somebody else is going to see it, and you want to do something for that person or to that person. <laughs> um, so I kind of was interested in that area of it, and with that comes, well, Maybe it needs to be uh, positioned a certain way or wait a minute, if I put a light here or a light there, it shows something about that thing, whatever I'm shooting. And so that was the focus. I've had a chance to see some of your commercial work and we're going to show some examples in a minute, but to do a commercial requires an incredible degree of control over everything in the frame. 
Right. Do you go in knowing what you want the shot to look like, or does it evolve over time as you're photographing and you just discover it in the lens? 90% of the time, I won't even touch a camera until I figure out what it's going to look like in the end. Really? Yeah. In terms of... Even to lighting. Are you drawing sketches of what you want it to do, or how, what are you thinking about? No, I, I just run it through my mind all I can. And then uh, the day of the shoot or the day before the shoot when you're getting equipment together, you're picking the equipment on what you're going to use on how you perceive your uh, shot and the technique and the lighting and all that. So is a lot of this just based on, on what you want to do? There's not a lot of pre-production meetings and uh, storyboarding? And, oh, uh, well, if you're talking like or just for depends. advertising, okay, that's a different thing. They like to have more control. And uh, sometimes way too much, and they think they know what they're talking about, and they haven't got a clue. So you're, it's a balancing act. Yeah. See, so I already know what I'm going to do, and sometimes I have to argue with them to do the right thing. And sometimes it's that's impossible. Uh, one of the most important things in commercial photography is when you have that first meeting, you got to ask a lot of questions. You know. You know, what are you manufacturing? Well, let's say it's a... Uh... A car. We'll use a car because we've got okay. examples of that. All right. Well, not much of that photography going on nowadays. But, um, okay, so it's a car. So it's pretty much obvious, the demographic, wh who's buying that car, what area, um, the cost of it, you know, the image they're trying to create. You have to know all these things. And I'm actually, uh, when I'm in these meetings... I usually ask the owner of the company or the, the head guy. I, I usually try to ask him, I want to talk to your sales guys. I want sales to know. guys? Yeah. See, they're the guys out selling those things. They know what they need to push them out. Okay. So that's the most important thing in selling anything. Talk to the sales guy. He goes, well, yeah, I know if we had this or we had that or... You know, if I could show a certain thing, I know I could sell it. I could sell more of these things, whether it's a car or a, a shirt or a well, salt shaker. Let's uh, let's talk about the cars and see if we can switch over to some car images. Uh, okay. Um, for instance, here, we've got a behind the scenes of you shooting. What are we doing here? What's going on? Okay, that shot was for um, Community Chevrolet in um, Burbank. And that's a Camaro. And uh, George Barris was commissioned to customize the car. And uh, they needed these shots for uh, some kind of promotion. So I, I didn't even talk to the Chevy people about this. It was, it was George Barris because he designed the car to give it a certain look that the company wanted, Community Chevrolet that they wanted. Now, are you using special lights? Because cars are notorious for speculars and, and having hot spots on. Yeah, they are. Um, this was kind of a quickie job. And uh, it was at a studio in Glendale or Burbank. I don't remember. They just had me come down there. And I had some strobes I brought with me. And uh, I also had some tungsten light. I mixed it, believe hmm. it or not. And... Um, I, pos I was, was particular where I placed the lights to avoid the speculars that I didn't want. And um, Let's show you the final result. Let's go to the next shot. Now, that is amazing. How much of that is in the camera, and how much of that is Photoshop? Um, well, I, obviously, I knocked the car out and put in my own background. The background, I, I designed that. I like to do that white-black blur thing. It's just kind of one of the things I like to do. But there wasn't much work to do on the car itself because of the way I lit it. Lit lighting's extremely important. Um, so may basically it was a knockout job and uh, making sure the, the tonality was um, proper throughout the highlights, uh, you know, just so it looked normal. Let's take a look at the next one. <clears throat> That's the exact same car. And you just <clears throat> changed the color? Just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. George. You, know, you know what's interesting about that is uh, I know a couple of guys uh, in advertising. And it says a lot of the car commercials that we see on uh, on television. He says uh, 
when you see those cars, they're not real cars. They're rendered cars. They're CGI cars in uh, in those television commercials. Well, let's uh, look at, go ahead, Mike. You know, that's, so that's, it's uh, what is real and what is not. Well, let's show you one that is a little bit different. That's yeah. clearly a CGI <laughs> probably, car. Okay, yeah, that was that's probably I, real. <laughs> that's a Lincoln. Looks real to me. <laughs> I think it was 1933 Lincoln. And at the time I worked at the ad agency when I was a kid, I was like 21, 20 when I started there. And I, I worked uh, a number of years there. We had an office on Wilshire. We had the whole penthouse. That was like a big deal in those days. And my boss collected classic cars. Oh, wow. And um, he had a number of Duesenbergs and uh, you name it, I've driven it. That's, that's not a Duesenberg, car. is it? No, that's a Lincoln. That, I, a Lincoln. I think it was a 33 Lincoln dual Cal Phaeton limo or something kind of name like that. And well, I used to take these cars and, and uh, just go out with them and shoot them. <laughs> Today, where, nobody would let you touch one of those. Where's that's the, a museum. What is that background? <clears throat> Looks like Arcadia or something like that. Nope. Yeah, the police came on that one, too. <laughs> that was uh, up Stadium Way. Stadium In, in L.A. And Legion Park, Stadium. that kind of? Yeah. Legion Park? I want to talk about lighting for a second, because yeah. lighting is important to you. Yep. <clears throat> when you're getting lights, do you care what the instrument is, or do you care more about what you put in front of the instrument, such as gels or other material? What I put in front of it, I don't think it matters much... Uh, what kind of equipment you use or what brand or, I mean, there's some good stuff for certain things, but if you know what you need for your end result, you just make that thing work. What do you put in front of a light? Um, I have a roll of uh, stainless steel screen like you would use in your house, mm -hmm. but it's stainless steel. So it's, it's good with the heat and I make my own, cutters out of that and uh then i use you know like roscoe gels or some diffusion you know well let's take a look at a couple of examples we've got suzanne here what are we, how are we lighting that <laughs> you're gonna love this see that light next to her mm -hmm. we were using that one as a prop <laughs> yeah those lights were used on gone with the wind oh my according goodness. to the old guy that gave them to me i knew this old cinema photographer He's uh, passed away, but his name was Pete Callion, and he was incredible. And he had all this equipment. He had cranes. He offered me cranes. Hey, you can have that crane for 500 bucks. <laughs> really? And I go, where am I going to put that? You know, I had the money. <laughs> are we in, in are the we, garage? Are we lighting yeah. her with strobes? Are you lighting her no, with just soft lights? No, I lit her with the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That, this is a unique shot. I thought, I kind of want to go for that. 40s, 50s, a little bit of, is you know, this a Rembrandt digital shot? Uh, is this a film? Shot with this camera with right here. that camera right there? Uh -huh. Right here. What lens? Uh, with that lens? Uh, no, I use the 8512. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the next Suzanne picture. A different look. Is it? Is that? Yep. That's a little dark. Oh, we dark. changed it a little. Yeah, we, yep. yeah, a little dark. Oh, yeah, I played. I Yeah, there's one there. I desaturated it in Photoshop, just playing around, giving it that older look. That's... Is that the desaturated? No, Sorry, desaturated was the first one. Yeah, that was the first one. Okay, let's go to the third one. We'll find one. Just another like. pose. Again, soft light with gel in front of the lens of the light. Well, I had, okay, I had one, one stage light. It was about a 750 watt right behind the camera. Sorry. Way behind the camera with some diffusion just for a fill. Mm -hmm. And then my key light obviously was in the upper left hand, the cassette like Rembrandt type lighting shadow. It's not quite Rembrandt because she moved her head. How are you lighting this, this up? You're going to laugh. We draped the background with some black, as you can see. Yeah. But it was so black. It was black, black, black. So I took, uh, rather than pull out another big heavy light, I took a, a, a clamp, light, <laughs> clamp light like you would buy at a hardware store. Yeah. yeah. And I put a 100-watt bulb in it, and it's just real close to the background. <laughs> it's a beautiful shot. <laughs> Bill, for people that want to know the stuff that you're doing, do you have a website they can go to to see more? Um, yeah, but don't go on there today. I'll probably be back up over the weekend. Yeah, somebody said, said there it's, uh, it's, it's, 
they can't get on it. But if they went after the weekend, <laughs> what website could they go to? Um, I have several. I'll go to WM, like William. Yeah. Lachas, L-A-C-H-A-S-S-E. Dot com. Dot com. And the Bill Lachas himself is the one you've been listening to. Bill, thanks for joining us today. This has been fun. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Stansfield started Advantage Video Systems in 2001, providing solutions for broadcast equipment and system integration, digital asset management, direct attached storage, and much more. Advantage Video Systems can integrate all of your equipment wherever you might need in your studio, office, classroom, or data center, and they can extend their services into a global support package. Their designers, editors, and technicians will help you achieve your competitive and creative goals. As Jeff always says, they truly want to make your entire day perfect. Visit Advantage Video Systems online at advantagevideosystems.com or call toll-free at 800-287-5095. Advantage Video Systems, putting creative technology to work for you. Jonathan Handel is an entertainment and technology attorney of counsel at Troy Gould in Los Angeles. He's also a contributing editor on entertainment labor issues for The Hollywood Reporter. And he's got his own blog at jhandel.com. As always, Jonathan, welcome back. Well, Larry, it's a pleasure to be back. And uh, there's one thing that's not as always, which is this is actually the first time I'm appearing by that's a video right. on the show. Isn't that cool? It is. We are we are having such. And what you got to do is you got to come out to the studio and let us show you all of our toys. We got more blinking lights here than Michael can count. It's uh, really... Jonathan, are those books behind you? Those are books. Have you read every single one of them? I've written several of them. You've written several <laughs> of them. Of course you have. Show off. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, I've got a, a question. We've got this new SAG after a contract, the new rate sheet that's out. Not the contract, but the rate sheet for indie films. What? does this affect? Who should care about this? Well, people making films uh, with budgets under, uh, roughly speaking, under uh, $4 million uh, are potentially affected. There are actually several different SAG or now sag after uh, low-budget agreements. Uh, they have different budget thresholds, and at the different thresholds, different rates apply. But all of the rates have gone up by uh, uh, 25% as of July 1st of this year. And some of the budget thresholds have gone up as well. So pictures that might not have qualified under the older agreements might qualify today. Well, if the rates have gone up by 25%, who needs to pay attention to this? If you're, In other words, I think the key question is, when should a director decide to go SAG after, and when should a director decide to go non-union? Is it purely a budget decision? Well, it's not purely a budget decision because the reality, of course, is that SAG after controls most of the um, talented and experienced, and even moderately experienced, uh, acting labor in the country. So, you know, the the ability. When, when someone says non-union versus union, you really have to ask, which union are you talking about? Because, of course, a studio picture will tend to be sag after factors, Writers Guild for the writers, and Directors Guild for the uh, director and assistant directors, and IOTC for the crew. So when, you, when someone says, I'm making a non-union picture, they usually are making a picture using sag after actors, but they're going non-union with those other uh, silos. So... Most people making narrative film, making fictional films, whether they're shorts, whether they are uh, ultra low budget, which is a film below uh, the budget uh, now by, uh, below two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's the threshold. Um, the modified low budget agreement goes up to seven hundred thousand um, dollars. There are diversity incentives if your casting is diverse. The budget thresholds are a bit higher, and then finally at the low budget level. 
as opposed to the modified option, uh, you're at a $2.5 million uh, budget threshold or 3.75 if you have the first casting. So if you're making a movie that's at one of those levels, uh, you're affected by this. Yeah, you we're talking, uh, especially with our audience, a lot of them uh, are dealing with uh, budgets that are under $250,000. And right. this is going to affect them big time because we're talking about what twenty five percent increase here, right? I mean, that's we that, are that's significant. We're about a day rate for actors, uh, for example, on the ultra low budget, which is below that two hundred fifty k, right? Of one hundred twenty five dollars a day for actors, uh, rather than the previous uh, one hundred. Now, SAG after would remind us that this is actually the first increase in these rates in ten years, and of course, this comes against a backdrop of increasing pressure across the country and moves across the country to raise the minimum wage. So, you know, if you were talking $100 a day or, say, an eight or 10 hour a day, you know, you're talking $10 an hour, 12 hour a day, that's down to $8 an hour, which uh, is below where people are raising yeah. the minimum wage these days. So it really, in fact, keeps up with what's going yeah. on. Uh, in the larger economy, does Ag, does SAG uh, and, and and after publish the uh, the number of 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 ultra low budget films versus the upper tier budget films per year? I've never seen them publish that. No, and I uh, they they tend to be very uh, circumspect about releasing market data. So I I don't know. It, it's an interesting question. It's actually uh, you know it sparks the idea for you know for an article actually. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and thank you for that. But uh, whether they would actually supply the data, uh, I don't know. What um, what does a, a producer or director need to know to be able to work with SAG talent? Uh, what kind of commitment are they looking at? Let's say you're doing a, a budget of say seven hundred thousand. So it's not real small, but it's still small. What right. uh, what do they have to do, and what are they committing to? Well, first of all, seven hundred k. Um, is exactly the threshold for the modified low budget agreement. The day rate there is um, $335 a day. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's definitely a pricier, uh, pricier tag than if you're below that 250K. Um, you are talking about needing to make uh, pension and health contributions, I believe. Uh, you are talking about being subject to some, though not all, of the union rules regarding things like meal penalties and. Um, force call, you know, time between when the actor checks out, when they check in the next day, stuff like that, consecutive employment, various technical rules that I can't cite to chapter and verse as to exactly which are included and which aren't uh, under that, that agreement. But you are committed to a, uh, you know, to a union regimen and the potential that if you get things wrong, that the union, uh, you know, will slap your wrist on that in terms of, you know, fines and that kind of thing. You are also, of course, in any union picture, uh, talking about residuals. So uh, these these contracts that we've been talking about are contracts that are intended where the uh, goal of the producer is an initial theatrical release of the movie. And uh, there's no residuals for that, of course, but if you then have subsequent releases, you know, online uh, home, you know, or physical home video, whatever it might be, uh, obviously television, uh, you're going to be talking about residuals. That kind of leads us into a related topic, which is, you know, what is it that you're making your movie for? I think it's important to think about, uh, okay, am I realistically going to shoot for a theatrical release and go with one of these agreements? Or am I going to shoot in today's world for an initial internet release, an initial online release, and use one of the internet agreements, which are very different? The internet agreements uh, have a lot of uh, free bargaining in terms of some of the terms and conditions, some of the rates and so forth. And if someone is going to end up most likely releasing a picture to a streaming service, not getting a theatrical release or getting a token theatrical release, it may be economically more sensible uh, to think about your project as a, something for internet release. That's something that each producer has to think about very carefully. Yeah. We have to to remind everybody who's, uh, who's uh, very interested in this whole thing is that SAG Indie uh, does uh, uh, makes it extremely simple, I think, for for filmmakers to uh, get all the resources that they need at sagindy.org, and uh, that's all you need to do. So uh, if you are confused about what we're talking about here, 
SAGindy.org has got everything that you need to know. Jonathan, um, Jonathan we've just had a minute left, and I, I want to come back to something. There was a lawsuit regarding unpaid interns with Fox that got reversed by the higher court. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's the summary of this? Because I want to bring you back next week to talk about it in detail. But tell me, like, in a sure. thumbnail, what's happened? In a thumbnail, the, the lower court said that uh, that the way unpaid internships were being done in this industry, in the entertainment, and, and as well in others, uh, was not permissible and that interns had to be paid. The appeals court, and, and as a result, a lot of companies changed their programs and are paying, large companies anyways, Fox and various other studios, and are paying interns. But the appeals court reversed that and said, no, these internships uh, programs were permissible as is. How that's going to play out is going to be a very interesting question. Well, that's something that deserves its own segment. What I'd like to do is to bring you back next week, and we'll spend some time talking about that in more detail because interns are everywhere in this industry, and we want to make sure we understand what the court actually allows us to do. In the, so, can, one, can you come back? Absolutely. And number two, for people that want to keep track of what you're doing between now and then, where can they go on the web to learn more? jhandel.com, J-H-A-N-D-E-L.com. And the J Handel himself, Mr. Jonathan Handel. Jonathan, thanks for talking with us. We look forward to seeing you next week, and we'll talk more about this whole intern issue. And thanks for joining us today. Thanks much. Bye, Jonathan. Bye bye. It's time for a buzz flashback five years ago today. Well, gee, you know, if we're talking about evidence in a court case in this in this lawsuit here, shouldn't we get all the evidence possible? The answer to that is no, there are competing uh, considerations. Now, does that mean that hearsay is always wrong? No, it doesn't. There would be value to having me testify, but we make a policy decision that there isn't enough reliability. This was a Buzz Flashback. called working with the camera and moving between sets. Here, for instance, I have a background. You know how to create that. It's in its own folder here. And then we've got text at an angle. We've got video. Glass begins and fire. So I'm going to select the project, add a camera. And to that camera, we'll add a sweep. And we'll press the F7 key, and we'll have it start about 20 degrees to the left. We'll have it go about 20 degrees to the right. And now when we press the F7 key and play it back, we've got something which just draws your eye to the movement, which is really cool. But it would be nice if I could have multiple elements here, and I do. I've got three sets. Let's go back to our top view. Here's the first set. That's the one we were just looking at. Then I've got a second set over here. I created it, and I simply grab it and move it where I want that set to go. And then I've got a third set, which is here, and I drag it and move it where I want that set to go. I'm spacing these sets out in 3D space. I select the camera. I'm going to add a new behavior. With the camera selected, go to the Behavior menu, go to Camera, and select framing. I want to move, I want to reframe my shot, starting about there, taking about that much time. I'm typing I to set the in and O to set the out. And with the frame selected, and go to the inspector, I want to move from set one to a target of set two. And just drag it in. So it's gonna, as I play this back, watch what happens, it's gonna move from that's there, there it, there it went. Watch it again. It's moving from set one to set two, except it's zoomed too far in. For some reason, the Apple set the default to be fit both, which gives us the wrong frame. You always want to change framing to simple fit. As we play it back, it goes from set one zoop, to set two. Then starting about here, I want to add a new frame and have it go from set two to set three. I and O to set the duration of the frame. Select the framing here. Grab set three, drag it into the target, 
and change framing to simple fit. And now watch what happens. It starts with set number one, and it moves to set number two, and then it moves to set number three. If we watch this in real time, watch what happens. Control A, spacebar. We see the first set just doing its thing. There's the second set doing its thing. And then the third set doing its thing. But it'd be nice if the camera was moving in the meantime. I'm going to grab sweep, and the effects are different if sweep is below or above framing. I'm going to drag it above framing. And now look. Notice how the camera is moving, the text is moving, the vid picture is moving, and it continues moving as it's going from set one to set two, and again to set three. Is that not cool? This Tech Talk was shared from Larry Jordan's website at LarryJordan.com. Suzanne Lachasse is a Los Angeles-based producer and actor. She and her husband, Ryan Williams, own and operate Screen Actors System, which won the Backstage Magazine's Reader's Choice Award for Best On-Camera Acting Class in Los Angeles. Suzanne is also currently a lead actor in a six-episode series of an edgy new comedy crime series called Sketchy. Hello, Suzanne. Welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Happy to be here. No, I was just realizing you were the model in those photographs that I we was. looked at before. Yes. What was it that decided that modeling was not the only place you wanted to spend your time, but you wanted to become an actor? Well, you know, growing up, as we were saying, as a redhead in Los Angeles in this sort of sea of beautiful blondes and brunettes, <laughs> you, 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 you stand out a lot and you're the butt of many people's jokes. So I would stay home and I would watch movies and that was sort of my inspiration for acting you know to pretend to uh to to be other people because nobody liked me and really yeah and seriously people made fun of me you know as you get older you know boys like you because you're a redhead but when you're when you're a little kid growing up it's it's tough. So the redhead thing really is it, it's tough growing it's up like as a redhead plague. isn't it it's horrible unless you live in scotland or something like that with your where all the yes, vikings and then you're not out. special at all you're yeah just, well that's true everybody is you know but you know everybody wants to be a redhead. Though. See, I, I never thought of redheads as special because I only had one sister, and she had red hair. So I figured everybody growing up must have red hair. And, and so I, can, I can't really associate with the pain that you went through because it's always been a normal part of my life. Mm. So it's, it's, actually nice a to hear, it's nice to hear the other, the other side. They call it a mutation. Is that what it's is, called? Um, yes. Mm, she just called it red hair. It it's is. It, it, is it, it is a mutation. It is a mutation That's of right. a... The awesome gene. So, An awesome gene. The awesome it's gene. It's the awesome gene. <laughs> that I it is a mutation of the awesome gene. In me. That's yes. right. Which is which is why which is why she's got such a great self image now. It's the awesome gene. The awesome gene. Yeah. I'm not narcissistic at all. I'm, I'm just I'm <laughs> all. waiting for the awesomeness wave to pass for yes, just sir. a moment. I was just thinking acting is not for the faint of heart, especially when you want to become a professional actor as opposed to just dabbling in it. What do you find are the biggest challenges to being an actor? I think the biggest challenge is in, in being a film actor is uh, having really good minimum movement. And you guys are editors, so you'll know that um, cutting together scenes with people waving their arms through the scene or, you know, indicating with, uh, you know, a furrowed brow or, um, you know, being too loud or, or trying to push for the emotion. Um, those are just camera considerations, but they're very important if you want to be on, on film, uh, television. If you're a theater actor, you know, you, you're taught to be very third circle the audience is is part of the scene with you and you have to indicate and you know the people in the balcony or you know they can't see you so you you do different things with your face but on camera the camera sees everything so you can be much more subtle um so i think i think film actors have uh, you know a little bit more work to do in terms of you know being able to have an emotion and having it kind of if you think of it as building it up in, in a dam behind your eyes and having all of that intensity go through your eyes i think is very important. What about uh, film acting versus theater acting? Which gives you the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the most creative ha 
happiness, for lack of a better well, word. I think, you know, I did theater when I was little, and it was so much fun because you get that instant gratification right. of being on stage. Um, you know, you can hear the people laugh, you can hear the people cry and sob and sad, um, and people greet you outside of the theater. It's it's a fun, you know, sort of thing. You get that with improv comedy as well. Um, but with film, it's sort of this, you know, at least for me, it's this self-loathing process where I just intensely yeah. look at myself and why did I furrow my brow there or why did I say it that way or I should have done this better. And, you know, watching dailies is, is uh, you know, you, that's that's how you get good at being a film actor. You, you study yourself and well, be subtle. Are you studying yourself after you've done the performance or when you're rehearsing? Are you rehearsing in front of a mirror to try to get a sense of how you're looking? Sometimes. But I do that alone. I don't want people I, to see me do well, that. Well, I'm not saying in a group, but I'm just saying you were talking about the fact that mm -hmm. the way that you furrow your brow or the fact that television is such a, an up-close media that mm -hmm. a small gesture has a huge meaning. It does. How do you practice that? Uh, by being in a really good scene study class, and um, those are hard to find because um, m most scene study classes in, in Los Angeles, at least the ones that I've been to, uh, cater more to the theatrical um, because, you know, they're in a, in a large forum. There's there's a lot of people around. They have to, you know, fill a four-hour class with uh, entertainment and get people coming back. Um, but if you can find a really good uh, film acting class that really stresses, you know, minimum movement and points of focus and... Um, you know, heavy text analysis, then 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 you're in good shape. And I, I think every actor should be training, even if you think you know it all, even if you're coming at it from sure. that very technical point of view, um, it's a muscle. And uh, if you take any time off, you lose it. No, really it's, it's very important that you use that word, that that muscle. Uh, mm -hmm. I was an actor a long time ago. I gave it up in, uh, in 2000 to pursue something else. And uh, if I were to act today after not doing it for 15 You'd years, be a rusty. I would suck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would mm -hmm. absolutely suck because I've lost that muscle. Mm -hmm. I didn't keep that muscle up. And it is a muscle. It is not like riding a bike. No, no. It's like, I don't know, playing football. I don't know what like the I don't football? honestly I don't know what the analogy would be, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it is something you must work at all the time. Mm -hmm. it and really if is. you're not working on 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 a uh, movie, then you are working in a class. Absolutely. And if you don't do that, Absolutely. I'm sorry. You, you, even you the, lose it. Even the best actors, you know, Oscar winners, they they get together. They they're I Absolutely. think there's a scene study class in the hills somewhere. And they all get together, and they no. When I was doing, Larry I was Moss working with all those people, mm -hmm. and when we were all we're all just working all the time, yes. because otherwise we'd lose it. You lose we're it. We're too scared to lose. You know, we're just you know too if you don't use it, you lose it. Yep. So thinking about that, what are your most valuable skills as an actor? You personally, not just in general. Is it your ability to to memorize lines? Is it your ability to carry an emotion? Is it what would you think your because I'm leading into uh, the whole idea of whether you should cast yourself in a particular role, a particular genre or not. Mm. So what are your, well, how would you define your skills? How would I define my skills? I think I'm very good at story, text analysis, which is really important. Um, you know, when, when you get a scene, it's really important to know what page the scene is in the script. Um, you know, The Hero's Journey by uh, Joseph Campbell kind of outlines, you know, uh, George Lucas uses for Star Wars. You know, where are you? What's going on? The character isn't always the same in every part of the script. It's important to know where they are, what they're feeling, what they've just been through, where they're coming from, where they're going. Um, you know, it's not just memorizing lines on a page. It's it's actually knowing where the story's going. I think a lot of actors, they, they're they so used to these scene study classes where they're um, rehearsing in a parking lot. They're getting the scene the same day that they're, you know, get there. They rehearse in a parking lot for an hour and then they put it up in a showcase forum and, and uh, they cement their lines and they, they get used to saying their lines in a certain way. If you use heavy text analysis, then you can, as Julianne Moore would say, paint it with emotion and, and really go there and, and uh, know the story and, and make it interesting. Um, so me personally as an actor, I think I, I come at it from more of a comedic, uh, sort of jackass way. Um, I know I'm really good at doing that, uh, but I, I do like drama. Um, but for me, I think my, my, my thing that I'm really good at is text analysis. I know that's helped me. When you say text analysis though, isn't that, it, I mean, obviously that's important from, from an actor's standpoint, but that's mm -hmm. also important from a director's. You almost sound like a director more than, more than I an think, actor. I think if you are, are, 
you know, for me personally, uh, when I first started acting, I, I just was very singular in my thinking of the actor is like the most important person, and and that is that's all I'm going to concentrate on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yes. you know, once I once I started working with the Screen Actors System and my husband. Um, who's a director, I realized, my God, there's so much that goes into it. You know, I started editing and I realized, wow, I don't like this. I need to stop doing this. This is easier to edit when I do this. And that really helped me. So getting sort of a behind the scenes um, vibe, uh, you know, going towards my acting really helped me. Um, if you can direct and you can edit and you can produce and you can write, then I think that makes you a better can actor. Can you direct and produce and edit I sure and write? can. Okay, there you go. Because back in my day, <laughs> we didn't have, we couldn't do that. I mean, the reason I actually gave up the the acting thing was because all of a sudden I was afforded the opportunity to edit and direct mm -hmm. and write. Mm -hmm. Before that, it cost too much money. Mm -hmm. Then it became democratized with Final Cut Pro mm -hmm. and uh, other, and DV cameras and things like that. And then everybody, every actor started doing that oh, because we didn't have to rely on our agents or our auditions. We just started doing our own thing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, everything's so cheap nowadays. Yes. Like you were saying with the new 4K camera, it's under, what was it, $700? My God. Um, someone can just, people are shooting full length movies with, with their, with their iPhone. I know. And there's no excuses. And we, we have Tangerine coming out, a brilliant movie that's out this week, uh, shot on an iPhone iPhone 5S. Martin Scorsese has an iPhone, uh, uh, a little a little scene in uh, Wolf of Wall Street from an iPhone. Who knew? Yeah, well, we got you can't tell. anamorphic lenses for iPhones and things. Like, go out and shoot your own movie. There are no excuses. Mm -hmm. There are no excuses. Go out and film yourself. One of the That's things right. that you mentioned is you've described yourself as a comedic actor. Yeah. Just hang with me for a second. But that was the term that you used. I've heard that a good actor can handle any role. And yet I've also heard that actors should know their type and play to their type. What's your opinion? Um, I think you you definitely need to know how to market yourself. Yeah. You know, what do people see when they first look at you? When you're a big movie star and you're, you've got an Oscar, then you can do, you know, whatever you want. You can do your your, your projects that you love. Um, but, you know, when you're coming up in the ranks, you have to kind of, you know, give in to what people first perceive you as. So for me, I'm I'm kind of, you know, quirky and, you know, have red hair. So I'm, I'm more of the, you know, the best friend supporting uh you know, friend type. Really, you're not. You're not. You don't see yourself as a leading, leading. You know actress, what? If someone girl? sees me at a, as a lead, you know, my contact yeah, information is in the description of this video. I, you know, I definitely do. I know um, it's 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 a that's a tough question to ask. It. Yeah. I do, I do, but you know, it's not up to me. It's up to casting, and so that's why I I try to do as many you know non union things as possible, and you know, indie <laughs> movies because. You know, people, you know, if you're good, if you're good, then people kind of overlook, you know, maybe she's not exactly the type or whatever. Well, one of the things that you and your husband have started is the Screen Actors System. Yes. Tell me about that. Screen Actors System is uh, we won the Backstage Reader's Choice Award for uh, Best Los Angeles on camera acting class. <laughs> oh, really? And that's uh, cool. Yeah, Ryan is a is is a brilliant director. He's he's directed, you know, Owen Wilson, Brad Pitt, Kristen. Um, what Kristen? One of those Kristens, and um, wig. No, not Kristen. I love Kristen Wig. Um, oh, anyway, uh, and I and, have a disease when it comes to names too. I, I know. <laughs> um, but Ryan started off, you know, acting in uh, you know conservatory in in uh, in college, and he's he's absolutely brilliant. And uh, but his his love was directing, and so he came at it from an actor's point of view, and moved it into directing as I come at it from an actor's you know, moving into editing and doing all that stuff and having a, you know, a, a big range of things that you do, not just one singular, I'm a director, or one singular, I'm an actor. So what we do at Screen Actor System is uh, we teach the technical aspects of film acting and, you know, how to get there emotionally, but hold your frame and have really sp uh, specific points of focus. And, and know where your um, light is. Know where your light is and know <laughs> what the, the lens is. Light. Am I in yeah. a wide? Yeah. Am I in a close? You right. know, uh, don't wave your hands through the air. Don't be theatrical. We're talking about you know, we're, we're splitting blades of grass here with our technique and, um, it's, it's, it's very technical, but it, it works. And, uh, one of our students, are typical <clears throat> students and don't tap your labs. Don't tap your labs. <laughs> oh, that's horrible. When you're in the editing, you're going to give the boom man a, a heart attack. I, Poor I guy. love giving the boom guy, uh, the, our audio guy drives him crazy. Hello, Ed. Hello. Can you hear Hello. Do it. Just go ahead and drive him crazy. <laughs> very perfect. I've yeah. got to work with drives him nuts. I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> He's going to yell at me. Oh, it's going to be terrible. What was the question? Oh, our students. Um, one of our students um, just, he uh, booked uh, two lead roles in, in two Spike Lee films. And, and oh, cool. uh, we have a really wonderful actress. She She's on a Nickelodeon show. And uh, we're all shooting the, 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 we have an order of six episodes for Sketchy, which we're all really excited about. And, and that's all of Ryan's actors. That's and great. So it's a, it's more of a, an improvisational kind of a, you know, the dialogue is improv um, with a general outline. I think that's just so important for an actor. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just improv. Oh, absolutely. Take all those classes, hon. And it's important <laughs> not to talk over each other because in the edit, that screws it up. And, and you know, it's very technical. Um, well, if you have a good sound guy who's actually got, you know, a couple of uh, little controls here with the two make microphones it hard for and stuff him. like that. Oh, no, it's Give not. him a gift. It's easy. Robert Altman did it all Give the time. him a gift. Dad. Walter Murch. He would say, <laughs> don't talk over each other. Make it as easy for me as possible or else you'll be doing a, uh, Apocalypse Now for how how long was it? Eight years or something? Yeah, but they, they ended up looping the entire movie, so it doesn't make oh, any difference. There you go, Brando. With <laughs> it was 99% looped. <laughs> it got terrible audio out in the field. For people that want to know how to keep track of you and to hire you for their next major market feature film, where can they go oh, on the yes, web? Please do contact me, uh, Suzanne Lachos at gmail.com. And to check out our, our film acting class, it's ScreenActorsSystem.com. That's all one word, ScreenActorsSystem, ScreenActorsSystem.com. And Suzanne Lachas is our delightful guest. Suzanne, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate that having you with Thank us. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. You know, Mike, one of the things I like is meeting all the different types of folks that we've had on the show. We started with Bill and talking about photography, and then we talked with lawyer Jonathan about what's happening with screen actors, and then we talked with an actor. It, it's just the range of people in this industry is just amazing. Isn't it fun, Larry? It is just... It, and, and, and what was even more fun, that we didn't talk hard drives, and we didn't talk codecs, and we didn't talk... But we can still talk cable coiling if talk. you want to. I think it's appropriate to do cable Frame, coiling. Yeah. It would be appropriate, I think, to, to discuss <laughs> technology in more depth. But but We'll do that next week well, <laughs> when I'm not here. <laughs> One of the things I think that, that uh, Suzanne said that I thought was really important is to understand what kind of an actor you are. And when you're when you're going out for gigs, go out yeah, for I gigs. Yeah, I do. That I mean, that was something when when I first started out, I didn't think of. But looking back on it, I probably should have. Uh, it would have uh, moved things. You know, I was very lucky and I worked a lot. But I think it would have moved things a lot uh, f- you know, more forward. But things were different back then. Everything has changed. Everything has changed. I wouldn't even know what to do today. You would. Uh, you would probably sit in the sidelines and. Uh... And just wonder how what how the highways pass and you pass. Yep, <laughs> I would just work for the Larry Jordan and Associates Group, and we would uh, be glad to have you anytime. <laughs> and you know that, by the way. There we go. The Web Buzz website is undergoing a makeover. You'll see it new is. changes every week. It will and have my picture on it. If you haven't visited recently, check out digitalproductionbuzz.com. You'll find hundreds of past shows. And thousands I of interviews. I still don't see my picture on it. All searchable, it's all, all online, and all available. Mike's picture oh, is there. But Larry it's an Jordan eight inch this. by six inch Digital picture. Production it's buzz. huge Larry compared Jordan. to mine. It's by the way, huge. visit with us on Twitter at DP Buzz and Facebook at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Yep, there you are. It's Larry Our Jordan. Theme music is composed by Nathan Doogie Turner. Additional music on the oh, wait buzz. Wait a minute, there's me. Provided by SmartSign in color. It looks yeah. wonderful, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, we used a picture of you from 20 years ago. Thank it's you. The only one you would give it's us. The one without Text gray hair. Transcripts <laughs> provided by Take One Transcription. Visit takeone.tv to learn how they can help you. Our producer, Serena Catania, engineering team, Megan Palos, Ed Golia, Keegan Guy, Alex Hackworth, Eileen Kim, Lindsay Lubert, and Brianna Murphy. On behalf of Mike Horton, that's the handsome guy on the other side of the ah, table. Here we go. The guy who's not on the website. My name is Larry Jordan, and thanks for watching. Bye. Production Buzz was brought to you by Otherworld Computing, providing quality hardware solutions and extensive technical support to the worldwide computer industry since 1988. And by Advantage Video Systems, who provide professional and integrated video and data solutions to post-production houses, 
broadcast facilities, as well as corporate, educational, and government institutions.